for the rest of the, well, we're, we're going till 3, I guess, or we have until 3, because we have to go that long, but I have to do early. Okay. I've got about a half an hour of slides that we can go over, and we, I can talk about all the little mixtures of char there for another 15 minutes, maybe. And then we can go up and, um, you know, I don't know what you all want to do with that char. Do you want to get some of I think out? everybody should scoop some up and put yeah. it in a bag and I'll right. take as much as you take want. Take it home. No, you can't have it all. I think everybody should go home go with, and have with a it. fight. <laughs> yeah. We'll all emerge. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have all those pellet bags, so. Thank you. you can take, some like take it as inspiration to make more. Yeah. And I also want to say if, if, the, if anybody leaves this workshop unsatisfied and you want more, I'm doing a, a full day intensive in Tequilma um, on April 4th at the Spiral Living Center. So you, the sign up for that is on backyardbiochar.net. And things that I'm going to cover there that I didn't cover here is uh, we're going to look, look at the gas fire stoves, how, how to make one and how to use one. And I'll go a lot more into probably composts and mixtures of biochar and also post, other post-treatment methods like how to crush it and things like that. So if you, if you want more, there's more available. <laughs> so are you going to talk about crushing here today? Oh, I might mention it. I mean, because I don't even understand why you'd want to do that. Um, well, we could talk about when we go up there. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is where we left off um, before we jumped into the energy part of this. And I think after we've, uh, some of the discussions we've had about cation exchange and stuff like that, now you probably have a better understanding of, of why someone would make this statement about carbon. So um, I want to talk about now biochar and climate. And this is, in addition to the wonderful things it does for soils, this is the main motivation for me to be involved in this. And to be, you know, to have made it my career, actually, not just a hobby, but trying to make it my career to promote this. Um, and here's a quote from, from Bill McKibben, who kind of glommed onto biochar early on. Um, he hasn't been saying a lot about biochar since this quote, which was probably five or six years ago, um, because he's more concerned with stopping emissions. So. In, in dealing with climate change and climate solutions, there's two approaches. I firmly believe we need to take both. One is reducing emissions, and the other one is sequestration and putting carbon back in soil. Um, they're both necessary. And so here's what he's saying, you know, you, and this is the potential that's gotten so many people, especially in the scientific community, very excited about biochar. Actually realizing that potential is a whole other matter at the scale that it needs to happen. But the potential is there, you know, we can put it back and, you know, for some of us who've been involved in environmental stuff and especially forest stuff for a very long time, Barry, do you remember standing on the side of the road and seeing a one log load going by and screaming, put it back, <laughs> right? You know, when we'd see those giant old old trees going down the road, it's like, oh yeah, they, you could, you would see those and, you know, it was always like, put it back, but you couldn't. Yeah. But in, when it comes to um, carbon in soil, though, we can, and actually maybe somewhat quickly. Um, so here's the reason why biochar, it's so important to put biochar in soil, and that is because it is stable. As I talked to you about, the, the aromatic rings are very stable. Microbes really can't eat them. Over time, biochar can get weathered you know, or oxidized, and little flakes of it come off. So over a long period of time, they can't, you know, they can, it can eventually be degraded, but in, in, in many cases, it, that's like thousands and thousands and thousands of years. That's why they use charcoal for carbon dating of ancient archaeological sites. So somebody made a campfire 30,000 years ago, that charcoal's still there, they dig it up and they can date it. You know, there's a reason it's still there. Microbes don't eat the stuff. However, um, you know, as we talked about, the charcoal is always going to have some percentage of volatile matter. So when you initially add it to soil, it will break down a little bit. And I just want to show you this. Okay, here's what, here's what happens with the biomass. It's 100%, all the carbon's in the biomass. Then you do pyrolysis, okay? Half the carbon leaves as the gas. 
but half of it's left in the charcoal. And then um, in the first couple of years, you lose a little bit of carbon because that's the volatile carbon and that gets eaten up. But then for the next thousand years, <laughs> well, next five years, and maybe the next thousand, maybe the next 30,000 years, it's pretty much the same. And, oh, there have been a lot of questions about this, whether it's really true, and it, you know, it is. Um, but, so that's why, by comparison, you know, what happens to uncharred organic matter? Um, because it also takes time to break down. But there's like a range of, in this kind of range, you know, if it's, if it's a thick piece of wood, it's going to take, you know, 5, 10, 20, maybe 100 years to fully break down. Um, if it's a piece of straw, it's going to break down fully in a year, you know. And, of course, that also depends where you are. If you're in the tropics, it's going to break down like that. If you're up in the um, boreal forests, you know, it's going to go into a peat bog maybe and take a very long time to break down. But that's just like orders of magnitude, biotrope's orders of magnitude longer lasting in the soil. So here's another look at what happens. So here's the regular carbon cycle. So every, every year the biosphere cycles something like, uh, I forget the numbers, but it's a huge amount of carbon, far more. I mean, if, if the bio, I think it's like 80 tons or something like that. It's beyond gigatons. It's a huge amount. The number is something around 80. And maybe it's just gigatons. Um, so that's the biosphere as a whole. And humans are, are increasing that by a few percents. But it's enough to make the difference with greenhouse gases. So there's a huge amount of carbon cycling every year through our, bio, through our um, biological systems. And here again, it's what happens when you do pyrolysis, half the carbon goes to biochar, and the other half is released as gas or oil. And if you use that for energy, then you get another hit because you're, sub you're, you're substituting energy, uh, biomass energy for fossil energy, and then you, you know, that's another, um, another benefit another climate benefit. So but that's commercially done, right? We, yeah, as, you can as do homeowners, that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, that's, that's untouchable for us at this stage to turn yeah, the well, gases into... You know, I mean, people are... are you, the, the example of a greenhouse was raised here. If you had a greenhouse or a, um, you know, or something you're heating with propane and you could substitute <coughs> a, a biochar unit, a little biochar furnace for that, you, it could be within your power. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. There's even a vehicle oh. that can run on, you know, on this process. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. A wood, a wood burning biochar vehicle, energy. and it creates yeah, biochar, and it also mm -hmm. uses the the byproduct part of it, the energy part of it, there to power the vehicle. It's possible. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's finicky. You know, it's. Um, but I mean, the possibility is definitely there. So as I said, you know, we can put the carbon back in soil. And this guy, uh, Ratan Lal, is one of the scientists who's really studied soil carbon. And he's saying, if you, if, and he's not even talking about biochar. He's just talking about putting carbon in soil, restoring the carbon that's been lost from soil, essentially, and then growing more plants, trees, grass, mm -hmm. any kind of plants. Growing more plants could draw down about 50 parts per million of atmospheric <coughs> CO2 by 2100. So we're now 50 parts per million over. We should, you know, we should be below 350, but 350 seems like a safe number. We're now at 400, and we're going up. Whoa. So we need to stop emissions, but we also need to draw it down, because 400 is obviously not safe. You know, we're losing our polar ice caps, mm -hmm. we have drought, you know. Uh, I, I don't think I, pro hopefully I don't need to convince anybody here climate, climate change is, is a problem. Yeah, yeah I understand by scientists are saying, you know, 20, 25, 20, 30, 20, 50, our carbon load is, it's really melting everything off. It's irreversible is what I it's heard. It's probably irreversible at this point in the near term. But anything we can do to moderate it, you know, still beneficial. Yeah. it's still going to be, I mean, we're talking about survival here, so. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, and this is the kind of message I really want 
kids to hear. Mm -hmm. You know, um, back in the in the '30s, there was in the during the Depression, there was something called the Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I read about it in school. Why don't we have a Carbon Conservation Corps to go out there and make all this biochar and mm -hmm. grow all these trees? Um, but you know, so here's the problem. Also, it's another part of the, another aspect of this is that. The carbon in our atmosphere is not just from fossil fuels. A huge amount of it is actually from our soils. It's from agriculture. And in fact, it's been going on for a long time. So ever since rice cultivation, you know, 10,000 years, we have been slowly adding carbon to the atmosphere from agriculture. Of course, you know, Why? industrial... What, what's that, from, from burning? Well, from burning, from deforestation, from... Um, Tillage, yeah, really, oh. from rice cultivation, which releases methane. Oh, yeah. And in fact, this is really interesting. But during the Black Death, you know, the plague years in the Middle Ages, which wiped out half the European population. Mm -hmm. Just after that, the forests grew back all over Europe, taking over the agricultural fields, mm -hmm. and the planet cooled so much that that um, they had something that they called the Little Ice Age. Mm -hmm. And there are people who think that it's directly related to the reforestation. So there's, it's actually really powerful, mm -hmm. you know, that there's a lot of room for increasing that soil carbon pool. So if most of our agricultural soils have lost half their carbon, uh, we need to put it back for a number of reasons. So here's some, um, here's what happens, Janice. This is what happens, is tilling soil exposes it to air, and then adding nitrogen increases the rest, the you know, the bacterial respiration rate. Oh, so yeah. those bacteria, they're happy with nitrogen. They got oxygen. They're just, you know, going to town and multiplying like crazy. And they're burning up because they use carbon in their metabolism. They end up burning up the labile carbon in the soil, so the compost and the decomposing carbon. Mm -hmm. It all just decomposes faster. And you end up with soils that might have been five percent carbon now being two percent carbon. Mm -hmm. And those soils now have less capacity for storing nutrients, they have less capacity for supporting the soil food web. They're poorer soils overall. Um, so this, you know, this shows all different kinds of uh, emissions from agriculture. Here's the rice emitting methane on rice paddies. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a huge source of methane. And here's the soil respiring emitting CO2. And here's the, you know, soil carbon. But it's getting lost here is CO2 uh -huh. when you till. And when you have bare soil with nothing growing on it, you're, you're emitting CO2. So, you know, and this is a global problem. And, um, you know, it's everywhere, especially, you know, look at China. I mean, they've got 20% of the world's population and about 10% of the world's farmland, and it's in bad shape. Uh -huh. You know, here are those beautiful prairie soils. You know, they were talking about how they store so much carbon. Well, we plowed the heck out of them. And um, so, there's a really long the, Not the Mediterranean, above the Mediterranean. On the, uh, oh, that? North of the Black Sea and south of the Black Sea. Why is that so bad? Just agriculture, mm -hmm. just, you know, growing wheat, whatever they grow there. Mm -hmm. So, Australia is not too bad, but Australia was pretty bad to begin with <laughs> in terms of soils. Oh, right. <laughs> so, this is a really geeky diagram, but this is from one of the real seminal papers about biochar potential for carbon sequestration and climate impact. And what this shows is what happens, it's like a, a whole like flow chart showing what happens to CO2. Okay, it's removed by photosynthesis from the atmosphere, so plants grow. They pull in carbon dioxide through their through their leaves, and they use it to build their tissues. That's the carbon in the in the in the wood. Um, so there are little machines that, that remove carbon from the atmosphere. And then, so here's here are the kinds of inputs to the pyrolysis process that are appropriate. So agriculture residues. Um, you know, forestry residues, manures, all these kind of things that we think of as waste, which can be composted. 
And that's great. And a lot of this stuff should be composted because you need compost as well as char. But if you char it, you get a little bit of an additional benefit because first of all, you might get some energy out of it. And if you, if you substitute that energy for fossil fuel energy, you have avoided fossil CO2 emissions. You're still putting some CO2 emissions back because that's unavoidable. Um, another benefit you get from pyrolyzing it is you get avoided biomass decay. So that's just the natural process of rotting out there in the woods. It's natural, but you know it does contribute to CO2. Hmm. And then you get biochar as a soil amendment, which stores soil right in, in source carbon right in the soil. And here's the, the, the kicker is this little feedback loop here. Okay, that says enhanced primary productivity. And what that's referring to is the little boost you get from adding biochar to soils, you might get more plant growth. And even if it's just a fraction of a percent more, if you keep doing that, you've created a, a pump, a carbon pump, that can pump carbon back into the soil and out of the atmosphere. So that's one reason why a lot of people are real excited about biochar. So here's a real extreme example of loss of soil and soil carbon, and one example of where a number of people are starting to use biochar to restore like a degraded, like a mining site. You know, so no vegetation for a hundred years on this. And they add biochar and in one year, they've got vegetation again. And yeah, and a lot of that is because of the water holding capacity of charcoal. That's a big part of it because nothing's going to germinate if it's dry. No. So then does the biochar do something to the heavy metals? I forget. Yeah, it'll hold on to those too. Oh, yeah. It'll immobilize them. Oh yeah. So they'll stay out of the water shed, water table. Mm -hmm. and How heavy would they apply that onto a situation like that? You know, they mixed this. It wasn't just biochar. There was compost mixed in too. Oh. Um, and I don't know exactly. I would say they probably had a couple of inches of, of that. So then you said you didn't have to really rake it in or mix it in. You just kind of put it on yeah. top. I don't know what they did there oh. in that particular. If it had compost with it, you wouldn't really need to mix it too much in the soil. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now let's try. And I'll talk just a little bit about what uh, it does in soil. Earthworms seem to like it. Okay. So here's a list of the benefits. Of course, it'll increase soil carbon levels. It'll improve fertilizer use efficiency. So you know, keeps your nitrogen fertilizers from leaching out. You know, normally nitrates leach really easily in the water tables. That's why you get all this water pollution from nitrates. Mm -hmm. um, it'll decrease the toxicity of metals by binding them and immobilizing them, keeping them out of the, out of the food chain. It'll increase the water holding capacity of the soil. And it does that by a number of ways, actually. And this is where you get into particle size, which is kind of important, because if you have a really fine biochar powder, and you add a lot of it to soil, it will actually wick water out of the soil and dry it. So that's just a little caution. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Too much. Too much. Yeah. You know, you want to hit the sweet spot. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. like rice, grain of rice size mm -hmm. particles is really good for water retention. Uh -huh. so, hmm. so I missed that part of how you... This is a different subject, how you grind it up. We'll talk about that later. You didn't miss it. Okay. <laughs> so what else it does? It improves soil conditions for all kinds of life forms. And it moderates soil pH. We'll talk a little bit more about pH later, but um, you know it's a real important issue. And then it just makes your soil loose and fluffy. Uh -huh. So it aerates. It holds water and air at the same time. So it's good for a clay type of soil. Yeah, it's good uh, for clay and it's good for sand. Yeah, right, that's the right. cool thing about it. So we talked we talked about this a lot of, uh, while we were burning that the soils in Iowa have this natural biochar because of the frequent grass fires. So um, you can see you can see the black soil there. That's mm -hmm. uh, a soil pro profile in Iowa. Natural biochar. Um, so in 2012, which was a drought year in the Midwest, um, the soils in Iowa actually did better than other soils in other parts of the Corn Belt that didn't have as much 
natural biochar. Um, and here Iowa State did these test plots where they added additional biochar and they found 15% better water retention. <laughs> That's really significant. Yeah, it is. Yeah, especially, you know, when you're looking at what's happening in California and now probably here too, you know, facing mm -hmm. perpetual drought. We have to really, really be careful. So this is what, what it does in the tropics. And um, I actually got to visit Manaus and see one of these terra preta sites a few years ago. And you can see, I think you can see that the top part of this profile is pretty dark. That's the native soil hmm. underneath. It's a highly leached, what they call an oxisol, uh, iron rich. It also has, it's also kind of acid and has aluminum in it. And aluminum is toxic. Hmm. Under acidic conditions, plants can take it in and it's toxic. Is, so that's is that what, naturally occurring? That's yeah. naturally occurring. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't seem to bother trees too much. But for something like corn, you know, that's corn grown on a native Amazonian soil. It doesn't look too good. And that's, you know, why originally anthropologists who first looked, studied the Amazonian Indians said, oh, they're hunter-gatherers. They never had agriculture. How could they? Mm -hmm. Nothing will grow. This is the rainforest. You can't grow anything. Mm. And it wasn't until later, you know, that they realized, oh, there were these areas of really rich black soil. Mm. And that's this stuff. And it could grow corn like that. Mm. And these were human created. Humans created these over thousands of years. Wow. Now, originally, they might not have created them deliberately. Mm -hmm. It might have been an accident because the way settlements go in the Amazon, people live on the high river bluffs year round. The rest of the forest is flooded half the year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have, they might, you know, they might be moving around it's during the, during parts of the year, but they spend a lot of the year in one place, at least some of the cultures there. And on those high river bluffs where it never floods, that's where you find the terra preta. Because they were living there, and they were living close, you know, kind of dense populations. They were living off of fish from the rivers. And they eventually realized that um, their whether it was charcoal from their cooking fires, they just, you know, clean out the cooking fire, you know, throw in the fish bones from dinner, right. oh, go poop over there. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe they had urns because they find a lot of um, pottery in these things. Uh -huh. Maybe they had urns that were their poop buckets, you know? And they, and they put charcoal in them to reduce the smell. Uh -huh. We don't really know. But they ended up with all this really rich soil that had not only charcoal, but also a lot of nutrient in it. So. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, if it was just a, you know, well, that's the garbage dump and wild growth, things go really good there. Eventually, probably they figured out that we can deliberately create these soils because they're, they're massive in extent. Hmm. So, uh, consistently, you know, when you add charcoal to soil, like if you have a beautiful garden bed that's full of compost and, you know, lots of carbon and manure, and you put charcoal in it, you won't notice a big difference around here. You won't. Um, but in the tropics, with those really poor soils, it could be dramatic. So these are, you know, the difference between uh, corn roots in biochar and not in, in Africa. So here's a few pictures from some plant trials, and this is um, these are beans, and these are grown in Hawaii, which probably has um, some of those poor soils tropical soils, highly leached, and, and that's a pretty dramatic difference. But these are pine seedlings just grown in a regular nursery mix, um, and the biochar ones look better. Mm -hmm. So the pine seedlings evidently like a little biochar. Um, and here it is, you know, a lot of people are looking at um, growing media, and what we put in growing media, potting soil, is peat, vermiculite, all these things are essentially mined, mm -hmm. you know, because peat doesn't really come back very quickly. Vermiculite is a mined <coughs> product, so um, they environmentally have a pretty heavy footprint. So could biochar substitute for peat or vermiculite? And, and it can. You know, the, the biochar one did better than the peat. Do you know what kind of uh, percentage of biochar they were? I don't know this particular one, no. Okay. Well, that goes to my question. For example, if I have, if you visualize a garden 
raised bed of wood, 10 feet long, 4 feet wide, 2 feet high with soil. Do I put in one cup of biochar we'll dust? Get to that. We'll, we'll get good. to that. Thank you. Right so these pictures just show the affinity that, that roots have for biochar. So a lot of times what's happening is there's nutrients and there's um, microbial helpers, you know, mycorrhizal fungi or um, the mycobacterias are living in the char and the roots go in there at, after what they're producing. And, um, and a lot of, you know, traditionally people always put charcoal in the bottom of their potted plants. Hmm. For drainage. For drainage, but also just, they would say it's to sweeten the soil. So it can get really dank in the bottom of a potted plant. Mm -hmm. And the charcoal will kind of keep it more, more air in there. Cool. So for instance, I have a Christmas cactus at home. <coughs> You know, when I had it, it was in a pot about this big, and it would, the plant was about this big, and it always looked kind of pathetic, and it would get a couple flowers around Christmas every year. I repotted it in just a slightly bigger pot with a fair amount of biochar, and it's been in there about five years now, and it's like this. And it, it's now the multi-purpose holiday cactus. It blooms Halloween. <laughs> It blooms Christmas. Thanks. It bloom, bloom. I mean, it's blooming. It has one. Its first bloom is probably the biggest, but it's blooming right now. Wow, it's, cool. You know, it's always got. I've never seen that before. So, do you mix the biochar in with the soil, or do you put it in the bottom, like you were saying? I think that one I just mixed it through. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, um, for container plants, I think biochar is a really good thing. Cool. And here's just some pictures from a scientific paper about um, the habitat value of the char, which some people say, oh, it's like a condo for microorganisms because it's got all these little holes and little pores and, and some things can live in there and be free, safe from predators and um, other things just, you know, people say microbes like to sit down when they eat. You know, they don't, they're, otherwise they're just free floating. That's why they go in colonies, that's why they make films, like the film they make on your teeth, the plaque, you know, so um, this becomes, you know, it becomes a substrate for the microbes. And then the other thing is, if you, if you pick up a copy of that article or read it online, um, there's a whole electrical phenomenon that's going on with biochar, because those fused aromatic carbon rings hold a charge. And that's very complex, I'm not going to get into it. Do you have a, a, link, a link to that article? Um, I'll, yeah, just go to biochar-journal.org. Okay. So, anyway, here's a picture of fungal hyphae penetrating a biochar particle. Here are some little tiny pictures of little tiny bacteria there just sitting on the surfaces of biochar. Um, and here's two examples of char from a forest fire. Okay, so here you go. Here's the answer, Claudia, that you've been looking for. <laughs> This is just the simplest way, and it kind of goes for any, just about any use you can think of. First of all, you must, step number one, pre-treat it. Add it to compost as close to the beginning of the compost cycle as you can, or soak it in liquid fertilizer like urine or manure tea. I don't know if compost tea will really do much without... I, I hear people talking about soaking it in, in air, actively aerated compost tea. But I'm not, I just don't really know if that's effective or not. I haven't really tried it. So I'm kind of be pulling everything out of the tea, putting it in the char. I don't, I'm just, you know, I guess I'm not convinced that actively aerated compost tea is that big of a deal. <laughs> you know, I think it's got, it can, it, everything dies really quickly and, you know, you have to have nutrient and microbes. And, um, the, the bio, Bio, Bokashi. Bokashi. Yeah. It's full of live microbes and bacteria. Yeah, and, and I. And what is it? Um, probiotics or anything? Right, right. You yeah. know, to some extent, all that stuff should be in your soil already or in your compost pile already. I think, you know, there are really degraded soils out there that probably need some addition. And I think, I, and I think the Bokashi is good. I'm just, uh, you know, the actively aerated compost tea, it, it could be anything, depending on how you make it. So, 
I use a lot of worm castings. Actually, what I do is a lot of my char, I have a giant worm bin. It's one of those, it's called a worm wigwam, and it's got a crank that it's a flow through worm bin. So you crank it, and this rake comes across the bottom of them, and the castings go down into a pan. They fill that pan with charcoal, and the castings fall right on the charcoal. So, um, and then I, I just dry it in the greenhouse, put it in trays and dry it and then I mix it, crumble it up and, and some of my stuff over there is that worm char. I think that's the way to go. Um, so that's pre-treat and number two is apply. So if you're planting perennials, definitely use it in your, in the, you know, if you're planting a vine or a tree, definitely use it in that hole. That's going to be great. Um, five to twenty percent by volume. Um, if you're, if you just don't have a lot of char, you know, you just have a little bit, um, you know, mix it with some potting soil and, and or, you know, or worm castings or something. And when you do a row of seeds, just sprinkle some in the row below the seeds and that'll give your, the roots will, it'll really help the roots just go crazy and get established well. And see, the thing is, over time, if you just keep adding a little bit every year, pretty soon you're going to have a lot. And then you'll start seeing your soil is really acting differently. It's not compacting, it's staying fluffy, the weeds, easy to pull the weeds out. Um, it just, it, you know, it just starts acting differently. And then you'll know you probably have enough because you, you don't want to put too much in. You know, one of the basic precepts of, of adding enhancements to the soil, I say, is feed the soil, not your plants. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I'll, I'll let you know on that, that, that compost tea, because I take bad guano, and I make tea out of it. Oh. So I'll do some experimentation, you know, try some with, some mm -hmm. without, and see what kind of enhancements yeah. come from that. So. Good. You know, I'd really kind of like to start a Southern Oregon biochar club or something where we could get together, because mm -hmm. like they have in Roseburg, they have a regular like mm -hmm. expos, and they get together and talk about how their oh. biochar things work. So. Maybe the Grants Pass Master Gardeners would be a place to start something like that. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, then the, the last idea is um, if you just have plain char, maybe you've just soaked it in urine, that would at least do that. Soak it in urine or fish and hydrolysate or, or manure tea. Um, they just spread it, you know, about half, you know, just one layer of chunks on a bed and till it in. And that'll, that'll kind of get you started. You could put a little bit more if you wanted. Depends. If your bed's already, yeah, it just depends. You need to experiment. But experiment on the lighter end rather than the heavier end, I think, is safer. Um, and then, of course, I, I didn't really mention here, but if you put it in the compost, then you just apply it with your compost like you normally apply compost. Okay. So, so does that more. answer everybody's questions? Is it pH neutral? No. So it, it <laughs> acidifies or alkaline? It's alkaline. Okay. The, especially the char we're making here. Okay. It's quite alkaline. And I'll, I'll, we'll get the pH test strips That's out. That's what I was Okay. That's one of the reasons why you want to go slow. Okay. Definitely. And that's also one of the reasons why it's really nice mixing it with Bokashi, because Bokashi is acid, so they're going to cancel each other out to some extent. So let's see what else I have. Okay, that's it. And you were going to um, talk about Bokashi? Yeah. Oh, you were going to talk about how you chop it up. Right. Crush it. Run over it. But okay, here shuffle. are the websites. That's where I have my stuff, and then I'm an editor here at the Biochurch Journal. Um, so that's it for the presentation. And so um, well, I'll leave that up for a while so you can copy those down. So chopping it up. Um, I've tried different things, starting off with just wrapping it in a tarp and running it over with a truck a million times, which worked OK. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. um, you know that stuff up there? We made a lot of it's from little twigs. It's already in little pieces. Yeah, I don't think pieces. you need to do much. Yeah. You know, because it will break. It's very it's brittle. Fine. Over time, yeah. it will break down the soil. <clears throat> it's always nice to have a few big chunks. Mm -hmm. um, if you were going to put it in, you know, I don't know. There's different ways. So, 
that's one way. Another way is just get a, a screen like um, half in, or quarter inch hardware cloth mm -hmm. on a frame, like you use to screen compost. Mm -hmm. And if you got big chunks, and then you just get a board and you just scrape it like a grater. Yeah. A nice rolling pin would work too, huh? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> or double rollers. Oh, double rollers. That's so, nice. An old washing machine. Of, actually, the uh, old kind of yeah. yeah. so, a a ringer. A ringer. Yeah, so some of my charred babies yeah. in big chunks. And so, and I wanted it finer for a lot of reasons. So I've gone through a lot of char chopping. <laughs> oh, so here's some of the things I've tried. Cuisinart. Okay. I've tried the Cuisinart. Ouch. <laughs> uh, it works. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Yeah. Sure it eats up the blade too pretty quick, right? <laughs> Sure, it's somewhat yeah, abrasive, it, but no, it wouldn't need a blade. But it's not too, too hard, though. No. Chipper shredder. Yeah. Chipper shredder. Okay, yeah. chipper shredder works great, but, okay, here's the thing. When char is wet, yeah. it sticks. It sticks, and, the, and it's all about the outlet of the chipper shredder. Yeah, you get the slime You know, up, yeah. and so my chipper shredder has this, it's a pioneer, and it's got, it's a really good one, but it's got this hammer mill that sends it down, around, and then out. Well, it builds up in this sludge. It makes yeah. the sludgiest crap you can imagine. Yeah. It's like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's sludge. Yeah. Goo. Yeah. Um, so you end up with this fine powder because it beats it to death and beats it to death. It doesn't move it out quick enough. Uh -huh. If it's exactly the right moisture, then it'll go through fine. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what percentage that is, but I can kind of tell. Can you know? Um, it basically it takes a couple days after you quench it with water. It takes a few days in the sun drying it to get to the right moisture. Mm -hmm. Now, if it gets too dry, then you have a dust, dust cloud dust, that's yeah. like, oh my gosh! When I go to start up the chipper shredder and, it, and the you know it's been it's had char in and it's dried, it makes this huge <laughs> cloud of dust. Gosh. You don't want that. <laughs> um, so that's a chipper shredder. The one thing I haven't tried, which I want to try, is a lawn roller. Which I think could work pretty well. You know, one yeah, they of those got the screen built into them. Exactly. So the ones you fill with water? The, the, oh, the ones you yeah. fill with water. Oh, they, they had the same thing, only it's a drum with holes in it. Yeah. To apply things, like yeah. oh. mulch. Yeah. Oh, really? And it pulls out the holes. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Once it becomes a certain size. Huh. That would be interesting. Um, other things I've thought of. <laughs> Um, a ceramic pug mill used to mix clay. Mm. Uh, I spent a lot of time on YouTube looking at videos <laughs> of uh -huh. machinery. <laughs> I haven't tried it though. Um, other people have tried things like um, a garbage disposal, mm -hmm. uh, which could work for, with your wet stuff. You know, for instance, the char in the pee bucket. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, grind it first and then put, the, put it in the pee bucket. <laughs> um, and then, but the best so far, the best okay. so far, is the steel leaf vac. Steel, steel leaf vac. It's that brand. It's got a little, so it's a blow leaf blower and vacuum. And vacuum mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, still yeah. brand. Still. Oh, yeah. still. Yeah, sorry. Still. Yeah. Not steel, still. Um, it's got a vacuum bag, and you just go up and you just suck it right up, and it wax it. And it just gives it one whack, it shatters it, it goes into the bag, huh. and it's pretty yeah. nice. Does it have internal teeth or something? It has a metal, a me little metal blade. It's a fan looking yeah. device. Yeah, it's on top it's of the impeller. Top it's of the an impeller. It's an impeller device. It's a leaf blower. Yeah. Okay. It's a leaf <coughs> Still <coughs> leaf blower. Wonderful and there's leaf only one skills. kind to get. Don't get a cheap one. Right. Wonderful leaf fat on a mower would work. It would. Yeah, if you have a uh, yeah, yeah. What did he say? Pulverize it. A leaf back on a, on a lawnmower. On a lawnmower. Because mm -hmm. yeah, we'll the lawnmower will pulverize it. And, then and right. some leaf backs have even on. an impeller too. Yeah, because yeah. they want to shred the leaves. Yeah. So if you have one of those, definitely try it. With a face mask on. <laughs> yeah. And earplugs. It's still, again, it's about moisture. If it's too wet, you know, my vacuum won't even suck it up. Right. If it's too dry, it's not as much of a problem with the vacuum because at least it's all going in the bag. Yeah, I have an idea. <coughs> I have a, you know, where I filter my dirt. You know, I have a, a frame that fits over the wheelbarrow and it's uh -huh. got that hardware cloth that has about a yeah. quarter inch yeah. or maybe a little. And then I just wonder, you could probably put it in that and then just take a log yeah, and just. Yeah, yeah. I think that worked pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I did that the other day because I couldn't get the leaf 
Back to start. Back to It's probably clogged with uh, biochar. Yeah. <laughs> no, it actually Clean the air filter. Actually you might find some stuff, stuff in there. It was actually a stick. Yeah. Anyway. So, okay. curiosity that the piles that are up there that have been spread out, if those were left, how long would it take for them to dry? Well, it's going to rain tonight. So. Okay, well, <laughs> give well, give us a good day. It's a sunshiny day. day. Are we talking a couple of days, a oh, week? Uh, days. Depends on the show. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe a, a three or four sunny days. They three won't days. get completely dry. They'll get about dry enough to want to try sucking it up. But if you went dry. out and maybe raked it every day or something and kind of spread it Well, it's it. already pretty spread out. Right. Yeah. So one thing that I do with burn piles to make it a little easier to collect the char is um, I have a friend who's a welder and he uses a lot of uh, old water tanks to make things out of because mm. they're good steel. Well, the skin on those... It's just, you know, sheet metal. He's got all of it, lots of that. He gives that away. So I have these just, they're the outside of a water tank. It's a nice big piece of sheet steel. Put that under your fire. And then it's a lot easier to scoop up the char. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's another little So tip. I don't remember hearing you say how small that char should be. Like to go through that quarter inch hardware cloth or... Is that how small it should be? Quarter inch. As far as the I, you know, for mixing in soil, a I mean, grain of rice size is really nice. Mm -hmm. Now, if you run it through hat quarter inch hardware cloth, what you're going to get is you're going to get always, you know, a mm -hmm. range of stuff. You're going to get everything from real fine dust mm -hmm. to because it shatters, you know, to little fragments that are just, you know, that ideal size to, you know, quarter inch pieces, and that's actually really great, you know. Um, the quarter inch pieces are a little bit better, the bigger pieces are a little bit better at holding water. Um, yeah. So it's just not, it's not all that critical. Uh -huh. But if what you're saying though is optimal to have it smaller. The quarter inch size. Well, it'll, it'll be more active in your soil. You know, if you do, if all you have is chunks this big, It'll be an interesting thing to have in your soil, but I don't think you'll, you know. You won't get any benefit from it. You won't get as much benefit as quickly. Eventually it breaks down. Yeah. So these biomass companies in Murphy, are they making biochar? I don't know what's happening in Murphy. There was a biomass you could take your lawn to I think they were just creating compost. Yeah. 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 It's compost. Yeah. I think they just shred it up. Yeah, so if you're going to organize when we go to the field, if I stay and do dishes and clean up the grange, Aww. can somebody bring me back a bag yeah. of the biochar to take I'll home? I'll bring you back a bag. No. Thank you. I'm going to start cleaning up. Sorry, Claudia. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'm going to just wait until I go through the, the samples here. Oh, that would be great. I forgot about that. Yeah. Let's, let's, so let's do a little comparison. So... Um, this is kind of interesting. This is barbecue charcoal, lump hardwood charcoal. Commercial. And, all right. Commercial, like, I can't hardly break that stuff. Mm -mm. You know, this is made in that smoldering, enclosed process uh -huh. where they actually want to keep volatiles in it because it's for fuel. Done in kilns, right? In charcoal yeah, kilns. Charcoal yeah, in charcoal kilns. Yeah. So this might be like Kingsford so brand. So it's not, yes. it's not Kingsford yeah. briquettes. It's not a no, briquette. No, this is it's lump charcoal. charcoal. It might be mesquite. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, I threw yeah, the bag. Yeah. But, yeah. but you can tell that yeah. even, okay, like compare the weight of this to, um, so here's charcoal that I made in my cone kiln, in my pyramid kiln recently. Wow. That's that, what you want. Little. Yeah, and that went through the shredder. It was, you know, it's a little finer maybe, but it's fine. It's it great. looks like my creosote from the wood stove. Yeah, but it doesn't smell like it. No. No. It smells mm. clean. Mm -hmm. So that's really yeah. nice. That's what we want to add to our soil. Yeah, this is easy to no mix compost. in your soil. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, it just blends beautifully. But it, despite the fact that no, that's no. wet, and this isn't, and this is packed in tight, and this has got airspace. Which one's heavier? You know, they're about the same, I guess. Maybe this is wet. But compare that to, to this. This is high carbon ash from a biomass plant. So it's dry. Oh, it's light. Isn't yeah. it wet? It's still damp. Oh, yeah. yeah. But oh, anyway, yeah. you know, compare the weight of this. You know, there's uh -huh. more in here, but they weigh about the same. 
because this has got all the volatiles in there. So you don't need the volatiles in the in your soil. No, you don't want them. You don't want them. Somebody pelletize? Yeah, this this char is pelletized char from. Um, it's actually a, an activated carbon plant that's making char and. Um, they pellet they pelletize it with sawdust because the char is abrasive and it just burned out the dyes, the pelletizing dyes. <laughs> but it's nice because it's kind of a dust-free product. And so what is their application of this? Is this a soil amendment? Yeah, they're using it for one. I, it's a commercial product. I'm not sure if I would use it. That doesn't come out of the pellet soap, right? No, no, no. So this is interesting. This is another commercial product, uh, Organic Solutions Vermichar. And they've added worm castings, and I, I know that it's about 80% char, and then the rest is worm castings, fumates, and minerals. Mm. And this is my worm char, like I told you from my worm wow. uh -huh. And it doesn't, this is, this is maybe half and half charcoal and worm casting. Mm -hmm. So this would definitely be activated then? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. And if anybody is actually interested in buying large quantities of char, I am becoming a distributor for a couple of companies that I think make good char, so you can what talk are, to me about that. What are large quantities, like a truck Mm-hmm. Yep. Or if you're interested in being able to buy bags at your local, you know, um, garden store, um, let me know and I'll call them. So you would so, bag it up for them? No, I would just distribute them bagged product, you know, commercial and labeled and everything. So here's two Bokashi chars made at different times, and one of them was a little stinky. This one, and I'm not sure why, but what, what I've got here is about um, maybe 20% char and 20% Shredded leaves with other, other and, and other stuff. Are you concerned with it having elders? Well, I, mean, I think. What does that tell you? Yeah. Were they composted? No, no, the way. Uh, so I guess you guys haven't made Bokashi. No, that's why I'm curious. Yeah. Let's you explain what it is. Okay. Yeah. So, have a whiff of this because. Figure out what it smells like to you. It's. Mm. it's Got a real pickly smell. Are you familiar with the yeah. So I don't know. I've been into uh, making kimchi and other fermented foods no. for, for quite a while. Uh -huh. And uh, basically the main thing is um, an anaerobic organism called lactobacillus. They're a whole guild or family nice of them. And bokashi is uh, it's from Japan. And the word means hidden value because uh, it takes a while for it to show. Show, show value when you add it to soil. It doesn't work immediately. And it's a combination of what they call effective microorganisms, mostly lactobacillus, but also some actinomycetes. Is it like a rice bread or something? That it's and yeah, and you can use any carb, any labile carbon source that's food for microbes it needs. So it's a combination of wheat bran, molasses, um, effective microbes, and it's just you know like a, a half a cup of this liquid and water, and then um, I add a little, I add some char and some um, you know minerals usually. And so these two though, these are with made with shredded leaves. So you know, I mean, a bag of wheat bran is twenty bucks. You know, leaves are free. <laughs> So, um, and you can see that this white stuff here, that's act actinomycetes. It's a, it's a root-friendly bacteria. That's about all I know about it. And it, it sort of starts getting that pickly smell. And it's, it's just a way to kind of jumpstart a lot of the microbial activity in your soil or your compost. Um, I use it a lot with, in my urine buckets, I'll put a little handful of, of this stuff in them. I'll fill the bucket with charcoal, use it for urination, but um, actually right at the beginning, I'll fill it with charcoal and I'll just put a couple handfuls of this on top. And there's hardly any smell, it's amazing. You know, even in a five-pound bucket full of urine, which is pretty 
dirty oh. thing. <laughs> so the urine actually decompose. Well, it's not decompose, but it be if you don't, if you let it sit for a while, it it's not useful anymore. Yeah, so yeah it's, 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 it'll turn to ammonia, and ammonia will volatilize. Yeah. So this is. I wonder if the carbon actually it, gets it inert or it absorbs it. Yeah, it actually <coughs> absorbs um, um, nitrogen in, in urea. Yeah. So, so you recommend the two. Yeah, I think the, the combination of charcoal and urine and bokashi is a really good combination. What's What's the recommended like minimal amount of time for leaving like? urine in the charcoal like before you can you, know, you can apply I've it. I tried to ask scientists that question and other people and I think a week is plenty. So you can't smell it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, or even just a couple of days, more than just one overnight though. Right. It, it just takes time to soak in. Okay. <laughs> Some people say One winter I had a whole 55 gallon drum of charcoal. <laughs> and I would just, you know, I would do little small buckets of urine and just dump, keep dumping it in there. By the end of the winter, when I dumped out the liquid, it was clear like water. Well, that's kind of huh. interesting. The charcoal absorbed Now, when you did that, the odorless. Would the was, there's still solids in you, and they settle out, I'm sure. Yeah. Was the drum that you had that in, was it vented? Or did, was it? Yeah, it had a lid on top. So here's some, some, I've just started trying to figure out how to take pH samples. You know, this is just real simple. Um, using a pH paper. It'll give us an indi indication of what what the differences are in pH between these materials. So litmus paper. Just your good old litmus paper. Okay. So can I have four volunteers, please? Yeah, we gotta go pee on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a pregnant yeah. one. I was gonna save my pee for my bio chair once I got it. Yeah. Fill the cup. Yeah. Fill the cup. Yeah. The chair says too. What are you doing? I just need you to put it in this. Oh, there you go. Okay, I'm just going to show you what these are. Okay, this is okay. Um, this is garden soil. In my garden. This is bokashi. This is from my cone kiln jar, and this is from is this is that biomass ash. Okay, so take the lids off and just you know if there's just dip it in there once real quick, and just the end of it. Yeah. Well, just yeah, just how many you pick, and then remember which one you pick. Okay, so what does garden soil look like? So it's just you just use this color indicator. What do y'all think? <coughs> Seven. Yeah, that's a little bit alkaline. Kind of surprised because I tested this yesterday and it wasn't. It was more like six. Oh. So I don't know what happens when you leave this in water. Right, right. that was a garden soil one. That was a garden soil. This one is, which one is this? Bokashi. Okay, that's definitely on the more acid yeah. side, maybe mm -hmm. like about four. Wow. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. Four? Yeah. Four, five. I'd say more than one, about five. Five, five, okay. five and a half, yeah. Brody's and blueberries both. Okay, so the Bokashi's not that acid. Um, and which one is this? So this is the uh, Cape Junction? Okay, the cone kiln? Yeah. Let's say, my cone kiln. Okay, and that looks like, what, seven or eight? What do you think? Seven, yeah, between, seven eight. Eight. between seven and eight. So alkaline, but not over the top. Mm -hmm. Now here's that biomass ash. Mm. And that's very last one. Yeah, this is nine or, probably nine. So there's just more ash in it. You know, if you did a, a chemical analysis on it, it would probably be 20 or 30 percent ash and 70 percent carbon. And it wasn't water quenched. You know, this was That's water quenched. That's what's going to ask, yeah. That's exactly right. the difference right there. Yeah. Yeah. Who is, what, what, what do you call it? Not, not water quenched, it's in the coast of Canada. It's not a retort. This is from a, a biomass power plant. Remember, oh, right, right, I, right, the right, morning right. I showed, yeah. showed you that yeah. chain grate? Yeah. Right. The Stoker, mm -hmm. the boiler. Um, so it's it, you know it's similar process to an open burn because mm -hmm. it's 
o there's oxygen available. It's just this, the char cools off before it can burn all the way. And they don't do anything to rinse it. So it's just cooled and then it goes into, it goes through a cyclone filter. And f well, no, the, the bottom ash, I don't know. It's a, usually a combination of bottom ash and fly ash is what this stuff is. I'm not, I'm not sure about this particular product, you know, what the combination is. So some of it will be soot that goes out and gets caught in a cyclone filter, and some of it is the bottom ash. 